Today, I want to tell you the story about Eddie Leonsky, the smiling psychopath, the brownout strangler, the canary killer. Eddie was a creep, a smiling, weird, twisted creep with an obsession for the female voice. One evening, he struck up a conversation with a beautiful young woman. And as soon as she replied, a fire lit up inside Eddie. Her melodic voice immediately consumed him. His first instinct was to wrap his hands around her neck and squeeze as tight as he could, pressing her vocal cords together, her cartilage breaking within his ferocious grip. Eddie wanted to feel that voice, that beautiful heavenly voice. Eddie was weird as hell. Hello strangers and strangelings. Welcome back to the Strange Bar and Grill. I'm serving up another true crime story time. So pull up a chair if you like strange true crime and storytelling, then this is the place to be here with me, JP. So kick back and grab a drink or a snack and, and always tip that like button. It helps with the channel. Join that SBG family by subscribing and hitting that notification bell to make sure you're getting notified when I release a weekly video. All right, guys, let's go. Born on December 12th, 1917, in New Jersey to a family of Russian Jewish immigrants, John and Amelia Leonsky. Eddie was the youngest of five children. Alcoholism was rampant in the family with an elaborate history of mental illness that was self-treated with alcohol. His father was a drunkard, abusive, aggressive, and a violent man. And when he got tired of drinking, he hid his wife. The only thing remotely protecting Eddie in his household was the fact that he was the favorite child of his mother. Her pride and joy, and she never tried to hide that. She often sang him to sleep when his father got violent. An innocent expression of a mother's love that later would lead to a major fetish for Eddie. Amelia left John and took her kids with her when Eddie was still young and escaped to New York. Here, Eddie was relentlessly bullied at school for being a mama's boy. His life was a horrible, vicious cycle of being bullied at school, coming home to his mother who sang him to sleep, getting bullied the next day, and spending even more time with his mother to comfort him. But pretty soon, Amelia found a new man almost identical to her ex-husband and thus began this same cycle of alcohol and abuse. Despite the abnormal family environment, Eddie showed no red flag behaviors, meaning he wasn't doing no weird crap like Dahmer and these other weirdos out there probably, you know, murdering poor animals and abusing animals is what that means. He was pretty much a normal kid, rode his bicycle, had a few friends, delivered the paper on weekends, played baseball, and became proficient in boxing, wrestling, and bodybuilding later on in adulthood. He was 11 when his mother fell prey to alcohol and became a careless mother. She became withdrawn, neglectful, just drunk, and jobless. She was sent to a psychiatric facility and she was diagnosed with manic depression and possibly schizophrenia, and she was locked away. Eddie dealt well with the circumstances, finished high school, and he went to a three-year course at a college and got a job at the local grocery shop. Here, his true personality began surfacing. It started as harmless stealing of like tips and then kind of bragging, you know, showing, boasting and kind of showing off his muscles. And it just kind of showed this massive ego that, that he began to possess. But soon it got malignant with him, breaking into warehouses with his brother. It became a regular thing till they were finally spooked off and shot at, you know, during a, one of their heists. Eddie was unharmed, but he was just very scared. This, this, this scared him away from that lifestyle. But this was actually only the tip of the iceberg. By the time Eddie was 22 years old, World War II had occupied the front page of every newspaper. In February of 1942, Eddie Leonsky, as U.S. Private 32007434, was shipped off to Melbourne, Australia, with over 4,000 other men, placed in Camp Pell. Eddie had the time of his life. He was drinking, he was working out, and it was here that Eddie discovered his major fetish 
his obsession with the female voice. He loved to just hear women sing. He drank off the words coming out of their mouths, their lips moving with the rhythm. He chose pubs based on the availability of a female singer and listened for hours. It gave him a high. It's believed that this stemmed from his only solace as a child, his mother singing him to sleep. And his second obsession was showing off, drinking his heart out. And then he would do this thing where he would walk on his hands in the pubs and kind of jump from stool to stool. But the joy at Camp Pell was short lived as Eddie became more and more consumed by his ego. At first, his colleagues found it fascinating. It made him look cool in their eyes, but soon it became tedious to them. Which this is a stark difference from when he was a child and he would get bullied and made fun of. Now he just has this overwhelming sense of confidence. It's complete 180 for his behavior. His superiors, annoyed by his behavior, sent him on a 30 day detention under 24 hour isolation and supervision. But as it turns out, this punishment had no effect on him. His 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 patterns were were set in. This is who he was. Eddie would coerce people into fights and would kind of turn into that bully role. Everyone at the camp began avoiding him and he started to get bored and he would start visiting the Melbourne red light district. The first sex worker that he solicited with was Beatrice and the night ended with Eddie assaulting her, hitting her over the head and trying to choke her. Eddie was taken to the police, but released without facing any consequences. The single incident hit off within him a, this huge fetish for crimes of passion and treating the opposite gender in any manner without repercussion. And pretty soon his behavior would spiral out of control. In April of 1940, Doreen Justice was walking home from the tram station when she had her, her fateful and unfortunate encounter with Eddie. Eddie would ask her for directions and she was flattered by the attention of the young and charming American soldier. And very sweetly, she offered to accompany him to the place so he wouldn't get lost. Perhaps it was the softness of her voice that tickled Eddie, but they went off together. And as soon as he asked to part ways, saying he'd easily find his way from there onwards, Doreen Justice went to her apartment, unlocked the door. And just as she was about to step inside, she was pushed from behind. She looked up to see the same charming American soldier standing in her doorway. And before she could say anything, Eddie pushed her over to her couch she shouted at him to leave, but Eddie forced her to lie down. And as Doreen began shrieking in defense, Eddie grabbed her throat and he would just choke her until she passed out. He would carry her to the bed and threw her on it. She woke up to find the madman undressing himself. And luckily, Doreen was able to gather enough strength and she just knew that running away just wasn't an option. So she mustered up the courage and she just asked Eddie for a glass of water and Eddie he would like reluctantly say okay sure I'll go get you a glass of water and he would pick her up and drag her to the kitchen with him and as soon as they stepped into the kitchen and Eddie's grip momentarily loosened up to reach for the glass Doreen would kind of wriggle herself free and she would run for the street screaming at the top of her lungs but before she could even get out of her driveway she felt Eddie's massive grip on her back as he tried to pull her back in. And at this very moment, a neighbor just happened to open his door to find her screaming. And the neighbor instantly realizing what's going on, you know, he, he sees Doreen in the grip of this naked man who's struggling with her and trying to pull her back into the house. Eddie would get scared because he saw the neighbor looking at them and would flee and run away. And he would leave Doreen behind. The odd thing is Doreen would request that her neighbor not involve the police since her husband wasn't fond of them and she didn't want her husband to find out. Also, she didn't want Eddie arrested for something he'd almost done but not finished. As, it, as twisted as it sounds, the neighbor respected her wishes for some reason and did not inform the police. Thus, Eddie Leonsky got away with another attempt of assault, which was a shame since he'd been reckless enough to leave his army badge behind. Like a moron, he left his army badge and a lot of evidence behind. Because had police come over that night, they would have traced it back to him and future incidents would have been avoided. On the night of May 2nd, 1942, Eddie had to reluctantly retire from his favorite pub. The pub had closed early due to a brownout with enemy fighter jets hovering the sky. 
And in that utter darkness, Eddie sat on a well near the beach, sipping his beer well into the night. It was then in that total blackout that he noticed Ivy Violet McLeod standing alone at the tram stop. Ivy, however, hadn't noticed Eddie sitting there and went into the nearby shop. He followed her into the shop. Though she couldn't see him in the dark, she knew a man had followed her. He struck up a conversation, and as soon as she replied, a fire just raged up inside of Eddie. Her beautiful voice immediately consumed him. His first instinct was to wrap his hands around her neck and squeeze as tight as he could, pressing her vocal cords together, her cartilage breaking within his ferocious grip. He wanted that voice. He choked her. The poor woman had no idea what was coming at her. And within a few minutes, she lay limp in his arms. The second her soul left her body, the violent forcing of Eddie's hands on her neck came crashing down and both collided into the shop's wall. Ivy's head slammed against the bricks and broke open and the loud thud would send Eddie into a frenzy. Eddie had just committed his first homicide. He kept sitting there for an hour, clutching her neck the entire time, unaware of his surroundings. And eventually he just got up, tore her dress off, spread her legs and staged the scene of a crime. As he was leaving the site, police officer Harold Gibson approached the tram stop. Harold had seen Eddie leave the place of the murder and had every reason to identify him as the culprit, but Eddie had left no evidence behind. The investigation went on for a while, but since the world war was always the priority, Ivy's murder didn't get the attention it deserved. And just six days later, a precisely similar corpse of Pauline Thompson was found near the American soldier camps. Pauline was a famous singer who'd come to perform at Camp Pell and had been later found strangled to death. It was then that panic erupted in Melbourne and after a long time, News other than that of the war preoccupied the page of every newspaper, that of a possible American strangler. Shortly after this, Leonsky actually admitted to another soldier that he had killed two women. And when the soldier told Leonsky to give himself up and plead temporary insanity, Leonsky just flat out refused. Leonsky was actually quoted as saying, I remember a woman singing to me and looking into my eyes. She seemed to be just singing for me. We were in a hotel drinking, and when I went broke, she continued to buy drinks. When we left the place, she picked up her bag. We walked along the street, and as we were walking, she was singing in my ear. She had a nice voice. We came to a long flight of steps. I just, I just wanted to keep her singing, and I choked her. How could she keep singing when I choked her? So I just ripped her clothes off. I was afraid somebody would see me. I wanted to get back to camp, but I had no money. So I picked up my cap and her bag, got two and a half pounds and threw the bag away. I then took a taxi and went back to camp. Several nights later, Australian soldier Neil Seymour found Leonsky covered in mud, asking for directions back to camp. The next morning on May 18th, a third victim, Gladys Hosking, was found in a muddy trench near the camp. Soon after this, the police received an anonymous tip hinting that the killer was someone known for walking on his hands. And after this, Eddie Leonsky was identified by a witness from a soldier lineup. And surprisingly, his confession came straight away and and yellow clay from one of the murder sites was discovered in his pockets. He gave no justification for his actions. He only managed to say, she told me I had a baby face, but I was wicked underneath. Being a US soldier, he faced trial at American military court. And after being declared sane by court psychiatrists, his hanging was scheduled on November 9th, 1942. The shallow life of a shallow man came to a shallow end at Pintridge Prison.
All right, guys, that's going to be it for today. If you guys like that story, make sure you guys leave a like. It helps with the algorithm, helps with my channel. And if you guys are new to my channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, join the SBG family. It'll help grow my channel um, and I can keep bringing you guys brand new videos, brand new stories weekly, sometimes two times a week, but mostly just one time. It depends on how much time I got. But all right, guys, be safe, be good. 